Hey guys, Eric Bischoff here to talk to you about my friends over at SaveWithConrad.com. Are you looking to get out of debt? Conrad and his team can make that happen faster than me firing the hockey talk man. Wow. And you know that controversy creates cash, right? Do you know what doesn't create cash? Credit card debt. Save with Conrad can help you consolidate high interest credit cards and all of your other debt into one low monthly payment. They can even help you get the cash you need for home improvements or anything else. They've helped 83 weeks listeners save 500, 600, 700, even $800 a month. Seriously, your papers are going to go down faster than nitro ratings in 2000. Ouch! And how about this? No house payments for two months. That's right, no house payments for two months. And unlike the dirt sheets, man, the reviews do not lie. With over 1,000 five-star reviews, find out for yourself how much Conrad and his team can save you by checking out savewithconrad.com today. Be grateful you did. NMLS number 65084, Equal Housing Lender. Woo! Welcome. Do something to wrestle with it. Pritchard. Who's Pritchard? Well, you know. That's not a rib. She put it. She put it. What a rib. No, you have a big There's no box of gimmicks. Rumor and innuendo. I don't deal in rumor and innuendo. It, it, it. Was he there? I was there. I don't give a shit. <laughs> I ain't scared. Fuck you. Fuck you, Bruce. I love you. Give me double cheeseburger. Double cheese. Double mayo. Double onion, motherfucker. Dig it, Bruce Pritchard. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Something to Wrestle with Bruce Pritchard. Bruce, what's going on, man? How are you? Word. All good. I'm glad to hear it, man. You guys had uh, quite a weekend. Congratulations. WWE setting records all over the place. Another successful SummerSlam in the books. And now we're back together again. Got the gang all here for a very special edition of something to wrestle. We're a little late. We would have liked to have done this before, but man, better late than never. Our topic today, the one and only Sean Waltman. I'm excited to talk about our pal, Sean. How about you? All righty. Well, Let's have at it. We, uh, I, I, see, I, I like the, the warm, sensitive, uh, kind of gooey puppy, Sean, oh, which is Sean. just who he is as a human being. And I mean that in, in the, in the best of ways, because I think that sometimes Sean Waltman gets a little, um, little misunderstood, if you will. And it's done some crazy shit, but at the same time, I think that the basic, the basics kind of have always been there. You know what I mean? And what I mean by the basics is, is I, I just really think that his heart, he's got a wonderful heart, just a, a kind of one of the nice guys of the world, not just of the business, but just like one of those nice guys of the world. I would agree with that. One of the genuinely most nicest people I've ever met in or out of wrestling, just a great dude. And I'm glad, you know, we've covered a lot of iconic characters here on something to wrestle through the years, but never his career today. We're going to cover it, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, but he is a story uh, of success, a real success story, having a lot of success in wrestling and having now success outside of wrestling. And, uh, man, you're right. Th that man loved his dog. And, and we were fortunate enough to get to spend some time with her and how great she was. And just glad to spend a few minutes today talking about our pal, Sean. And yeah. I guess let's start at the beginning, man. Like your first time seeing him probably would have been global. Am I guessing that right? Yeah, I think so. I, I don't know if I had ever seen him before that, but I think that uh, the first time I, well, I don't think I know the first time I ever met him was in Dallas at the old sportatorium. And he was standing in a long leather duster talking to scotty flamingo and uh came in and said hello and we sat there and, and talked and um they were like oh you ever worked here before i said you know what i never had they go yeah it's not what we thought either <laughs> it just was okay very good 
So that was your first time in the sportatorium as well? Yeah, sure was. It's one of those buildings where I think people who watched it on television probably assumed it was more than what it really was, much like folks at the corner of Swanson and Rittner found out in Philadelphia about the ECW arena. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's funny. Those old buildings that are romanticized and the sportatorium is one of them, but the sportatorium was pretty much a shithole. Uh, tin building, no air conditioning, rats the size of dogs, and that's no exaggeration. I'm not talking like a, a chihuahua or anything like that. I'm talking like a Labrador. Um, and it, it was, but there was just so much history there, man. Elvis played there. Willie Nelson played there. Michael Hayes and the Bad Street Band played there. So it's a building rich with history, which gives it that aura. And I think that's where the, the romance comes in. However, the building itself, yeah, it was pretty much a um, rundown piece of crap. Was there ever a, a building that was sort of famous, a famous wrestling building that was nicer than you expected? I mean, we know ECW Arena and Sportatorium, maybe not what we would have imagined in a bad way, but did one exceed your expectations? Like I'd always heard about it and I got there and somehow it was even better. No, I don't know that it was better. I, I tell you, the Omni in Atlanta was was not a letdown. Uh, I got to work in the Omni before they tore it down, and the Omni, I thought, was a nice building. I thought that, uh, you know, the Sam Houston Coliseum in Houston, at least it was a nice building. You know, it was um, maintained fairly well as far as municipal properties in that time, but... I don't know that there was ever one that was like, oh, my God, this is better than I ever. I, I take that back. Hershey, Pennsylvania. Uh, oh, really? This was from a, I guess, television shooting standpoint. But it was it was just electric. And maybe Madison Square Garden because the garden's the garden. I love that. So what was your first impression of Sean Waltman? You said you see him in a leather duster. I think at the time he was wrestling as the lightning kid. Do I have that right? Yeah, I think so. He's going to uh, wind up becoming the global light heavyweight champion. He's going to defeat Jerry Lynn and Dallas for that opportunity. Uh, this is very much a different time and place in wrestling. I mean, these days, lots and lots of our favorite wrestlers that we see on Monday or Friday or whatever, uh, look just like Jerry Lynn and the lightning kid here, Sean Waltman. But this is still very much the era of the behemoths in the World Wrestling Federation. Did you think, hey, this is the future of wrestling? It's going to be more fast-paced and more athletic? Or what was your first impression of his style and just guys of his stature breaking into the business and doing what they do? I don't know necessarily that I looked at it and said, oh, hey, this is what the business is going to turn into. Because it still hasn't. However, I think that their skill and the presentation of how they worked and what they could do. You know, you go back and you look at guys that were not the biggest guys in the business that were able to take an audience and captivate them. And I, and I always point to the Rock and Roll Express, number one, because the Rock and Roll Express, Ricky Morton and Robert Gibson, came in to the Mid-South Territory run by Bill Watts in the early 80s, which was a giant man territory. I mean, everybody was huge. They were able to captivate, they were able to get over, and they were able to introduce that audience to a completely different style and made people believe. And the first thing that they did that I remember with Ricky and Robert was they had him go over Nikolai Volkov and Crusher Khrushchev, Barry Darso, who were huge, 300 plus pounds. And the Rock and Roll Express brought in his tag team experts. And they explained it because of their style, because of their tag team strategy of tagging in and out and how they worked together as a team that they were able to overcome. And I think that when you go back to guys like Sean Waltman as the Lightning Kid and Jerry Lynn, the way that they worked with one another, you could believe it when they were working with each other. Then when they were working with someone larger than them, they used that same speed and they used the same technique to overcome a larger opponent. And as long as you could make it believable, 
But if they're in there doing the same thing the big guys are doing, it does not work. And I think that that was kind of what made uh, Sean and to a, to another degree Jerry Lynn stand out. Speed more so maybe than even the the high flying stuff. I mean, when I think of those guys, certainly they're doing more aerial stuff than say a Hulk Hogan or an Ultimate Warrior. I don't necessarily think of them as being high flyers, but speed is what I associate with them. Would you agree with that? A different, just a different approach, a completely different approach to the match. Um, they weren't going to sit there and brawl with you. It wasn't power and it was skill versus, you know, power and big moves and things of that nature. You didn't think that those guys could knock anybody out. Well, their matches were ahead of their time. Go out of your way to see them. Uh, would that have been the would that have been the first time you would have seen something like that, or did you think, hey, this is just a an Americanized version of Lucha? Maybe I thought it was inspired by the Luchas, but again, you know, it's it's just um, those are probably the first guys that exposed it to a modern television audience, right? Uh, I think everybody had had smaller guys in their territories that work differently than, than everybody else. So they have two guys. And, and again, it was just the first time I think that the exposure to a national audience, even though the audience you know, should have been much bigger than it was. Um, yeah. I thought they were the, I thought they did a good job of exposing that. It's crazy to think that none of this almost happened. I, I think there's a pretty crazy story out there that, Sean was working for Dennis Carluzzo in New Jersey, and he had an opponent overshoot him on a suicide dive and land on his head. And uh, he wound up with a blood clot, nearly had to retire from wrestling over this. And that was way back in 92. Uh, we haven't spent a lot of time talking about Dennis Carluzzo. What was your interactions with him like over the years? Just met Dennis. Uh, that's it. Yeah, I, I think I met Dennis through Jim Cornette. Nice guy, but beyond that, I never had any uh, business dealings with Dennis whatsoever. Well, the big day finally comes. Everybody's looking for opportunity, and Sean Waltman got his. The day after WrestleMania 9, he gets a tryout with the World Wrestling Federation. They're doing a show in Phoenix. His opponent that night is going to be a very young Luis Bacoli. Who do you think would have helped get... Sean Waltman, his tryout match. Would that have been someone who saw his stuff in global perhaps? Probably. Yeah. And again, it was not thinking of anything more than, Hey, here's an opportunity and uh, come on in and we should take a look at this kid. He's different, but don't think that you're going to have a, a guy that is going to be the next superstar, but he's going to be a good addition. And, uh, He's different. In that era, w would Vince have been looking for, or, or, or who would have been, let's talk about 1993, like guys who were handling talent relations. That's still JJ Dillon at that point. And would there have been anyone uh, else involved in quote unquote scouting? There was no scouting at that time. It was, yeah, it was guys sending tapes in and if they got a break. They, I, I don't even know who, who booked the enhancement talent at that time. Do you uh, think it was Howard Finkel who would review the tapes? And if something stood I know out, Howard here, did review tapes, but beyond that, um, yeah, beyond that, I don't know. I really don't know. Let's but talk about the, the, the concept of a tryout match. What in 1993, not now, but in 1993, what was WWE looking for? Like you had to go out there and show them a match, but what specifically would make the difference between, Oh yeah, that guy's got it and mm, not quite ready. Is there one thing in particular that it. always worked or never worked? <laughs> yeah, you know, you're looking for it. Yeah. And you can't always put your finger on what it is. But if someone can go out that no one knows who the hell they are and have an audience sitting on their the edge of their seats by the end of the match, then you're going to take notice. Or some people go out there and just completely shit the bed. Um I really don't think that um, there was anything, you know, monumental. You, you don't go out. You don't have a checklist of, well, they right. must do this. They must do that. No, it's a feeling. You watch. I can tell a lot about a guy during the day. If 
there's a ring out there and someone goes in and I watch how they get into the ring. I watch how they walk in the ring. And especially if you, you watch someone who gets in the ring and just kind of sits in the corner and lays in the ring and makes it their own and, and, and are at home. Then there's guys that get in the ring and it's, it's a bit foreign to them. I also watch mm -hmm. you guys wipe their, they wipe their boots off before they get in the ring. It's, it's little things. It's, it's, it's all, it's all kind of things that it, 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 I don't give a shit if they're the greatest worker in the world, but if they're comfortable at what they do and they're good and they're able to garner a reaction, then that's good. There, there is no, there's no checklist so much of a feel that you either have it or you don't. I mean, I'm sure if a guy had some sort of hot move, like, uh, you know, if Scott Steiner created another Frankensteiner or something spectacular, maybe that would stand out. But mostly what you're looking for is confidence in the way they carry themselves and the way they interact with the audience. Would that be fair to say, or is it selling? Or make a, the, no, I mean, someone that can make a connection. I, I'll, I'll tell you this, as far as, uh, audition tapes, when someone would send in a tape, if all they sent you was highlights of them looking great and winning matches, it went in the trash. Wow. See how some, well, it means nothing. Okay. Wow. You can do some great moves. Show me that you can sell. Show mm. me. I'd like to see how you lose. There, there's a lot of different things that you, you want to be well-rounded. You want to be able to do it all and you want to be able to, um, captivate. And if you have a hard time captivating an audience that wants to be captivated, then how are you going to captivate an arena? Well said. Well, the next night he gets another tryout. This time we're in Tucson. He's going to get a win over Louis Spicoli. Um, when, when a guy gets a second match, you know, he's not just doing one tryout match, if you will, but he gets a quote unquote callback. That's gotta be a good sign, right? I mean, if it was the quote unquote shits, we might not do the second one, but maybe the second one is like, all right, let's try them. Let's have them do a different match or let's have so-and-so take a look this time. Is that sort of the thinking? Probably just booked for two matches. I mean, that's the reality of it. Got Again, and, and if they were drizzling shit, they might have been not used for that second match. But right. uh, uh, beyond that, it was probably just the fact they were booked for two matches. What do you think, or do you recall what Vince's impression of uh, of Sean Waltman is? I just want to add context. This is 1993, so we're knee deep in steroid discussions. Uh, and, and as a result, we're not necessarily looking for the hulking giants that we have in the past, pardon the pun. We are looking for guys who, I mean, Bret Hart's been our champion for a while here. So we're looking for more traditional sized athletes, not just the giant jacked up superheroes, but with a guy like Waltman, who he's even a little smaller than a guy like Bret Hart, would that get him typecast automatically? I mean, I know on the WCW side of things, we've heard guys talk about not wanting to be classified as a cruiserweight. And I think there's a famous story that we may talk about later where I think Waltman was upset with a payoff and asked JR, are you paying me by the pound? Uh, do you think Vince had a perception of, okay, this guy is a light heavyweight or maybe he could be an intercontinental or does that not really the way it worked back then? Well, first of all, I don't think Vince even saw Waltman in a ring until we got to the Manhattan center. Um, so, you know, I think that Vince probably would have looked at him and goes, who's this skinny little kid? Hmm. But. Well, it, he must have impressed somebody because he does make TV. He debuts on Monday Night Raw in a losing effort against Doink. His tights say L kid, but he's known here and billed here as the Kamikaze kid. It's a squash match. In fact, two were taped that night. Any idea why two were taped? Is this just, uh, hey, we need a do-over, you think? Yeah, because first one sucked. Okay. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's usually why you do-over. Um, yeah. But it, it was that was the first time in, in the Manhattan Center that Vince ever laid eyes on him in the ring. The reaction, because we were sitting at ringside, you know, for commentary, and Sean came out the audience was chanting lightning kid, lightning kid, lightning kid. 
And it's like, what are they chanting? I said, well, what do you work says lightning kid? And uh, he's like, hmm. All right. So he was intrigued because the audience knew who he was. And then, you know, watched, you know, watched the match and was like, okay, you know, he held his own in there with Matt Bourne and was like, all right, interesting. So the, the, the first thing, you know, I think was we did Kamikaze Kid. I think we did like two or three different names before they finally landed. You know, the, the audience is the one that dubbed him one, two, three kid. Yeah. So let's mention that the next week or the next time we see him, he's known as cannonball kid. Yeah. This will be a losing effort against Mr. Hughes on raw. Um, I assume, and, and maybe this is on me. Are you just using him in an enhancement role here? Or did you have the idea to, Hey, we're going to have him in this enhancement role, establish him as that to the audience, much like maybe we did once upon a time for Barry Horowitz. And then when he gets the big win, it really is a bona fide upset because every time we've seen this guy, he's lost. Was that absolutely. part of the plan or did you back into that? No, absolutely. You know, we were looking for someone, uh, for razor and yeah, if you, if, if you're able to look at an underdog and someone who was not likely to beat a razor Ramon, I think you would look at kid at that point in time. So, you you put him in the ring with with Razor, the audience automatically is coming to the conclusion Razor's going to kill this guy. Yes. So the uh, the different names, you know, the Kamikaze Kid, the Cannonball Kid. This is by design, or again, is that, that was us having fun. That okay. that was us, you know, looking for. Um, the funny thing is, is we were really looking for something that would stick. No, no different than Johnny Nitro and John Morrison and the different things that we did with, with John Hennigan that it kind of depended upon, okay, well, let's try this this week. Let's try that this week. And then bam, you know, the, the, the lightning in a bottle, if you will, baby, it just, it just, it just struck, baby. It just clear out the sky. He was there one day and boom, knocked the little ass out. One, two, three. And everybody chant one, two, three. And he's a kid. So let's call him one, two, three kid, if you will. Hey, let's talk about that first match. I want to go back to that doink match that you said, Hey, the reason we do a match again is because the first one sucked. Well, that's pretty obvious. And I appreciate that. But I do wonder if you had to chalk that up and again, you weren't in the ring. You don't really know exactly, but if you had to take a guess, knowing the parties involved, do you think that was a function of Sean was only used to working global type matches as far as their TV? Was it just nerves? Was it a uh, size? Yeah. No. Okay. I mean, you know, who knows? It, it could just, you know, be a, a clash, a clash of styles, a clash of. Uh, Sometimes they don't click. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's 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 time we talk about the moment that he became a made man. I mean, it's one of the more important Monday Night Raws in history, certainly of the early years. And it's a very special Raw. We would see Marty Jannetty come out of the crowd to return and somehow defeat Shawn Michaels to win the Intercontinental title. And then later in that same show, we see the match with Razor Ramon and one, two, three kid. Now this has been beaten up and discussed a million different times. Uh, but this is the biggest upset maybe of that whole generation. One, two, three kid in the L kid tights steals the win, uh, with that moonsault off the top. And as I understand it, it almost didn't happen. There's a situation where he takes a bad, nasty bump on the outside. He's knocked for a loop, but he still finishes and pulls it off. Uh, he's got this sack of money. He's going to run to the back with here comes razor after him, a really special moment in the early days of Monday night raw. And this is a whole different era of Monday night raw, the Manhattan center. Just talk to us a bit about what that Manhattan center vibe was like. How did it feel compared to a traditional say superstars taping? Uh, what was different, what was good, what was bad, and then what you remember of that night and the execution of this crazy match? Well, Manhattan Center was New York. It was the epicenter, and it was so intimate. Uh, so much history in that building as well that, that, you know, it had a different feel. It wasn't a big arena. It wasn't a 15,000-seat arena. It was a small 1,200-seat um 
just beautiful <laughs> like banquet room it was right it was insane um but the new york audience and that new york audience that was live that was passionate that you know very judgmental and as the saying goes you can make it there you can make it anywhere so yep. you're in manhattan center in the heart of manhattan that by god if you could get that audience you can get any audience and it was um it could be a tough vibe at, some, at times man if you didn't give them what they wanted they let you know yeah very much like a philly crowd mm -hmm. but that was that was made raw and the manhattan center a unique experience other it was it was different than the arena experience so it, it was fun and, um, you know, could be fun to play to, or it could be a disaster to play to. Do you remember that particular day, you know, what the vibe and energy were like, and more specifically, do you recall who would have been the person to sit down and go over this creative with both Scott Hall and Sean Waltman? I have no idea. I mean, I know that we talked about it. I, I know I talked to, to everybody about it, it as far as the story and what, what we're going to do, but I have no idea who laid out their match. It was a different time, dude. It, it was, you know, believe it or not, there was a time where, you know, guys didn't lay out every single move that they, sure you know, do in a match. It was a, hey, here's what we're going to do. Go out and do it. And no, I get that. I'm gonna confidence in, in the in the performer to actually be able to do that. So it was, Hey, here's the story that we want to get out of this. This is what we're going to do and, uh, come up with, with that right finish and probably worked with whoever their producer agent was and got her going. I didn't mean to ask about the mechanics of the match. My apologies. If that's the way it came off, I was asking more specifically about, I mean, razor's doing the honor here for a relative unknown for an enhancement guy. It's a great story, but, Mm -hmm. You got a, a made guy here doing a favor for a young guy. I wondered if there was any pushback from that. And, and on the other side, how elated Waltman was, because I imagine you wouldn't just have him here on an enhancement contract. Now we're going to put you on a real contract. If you're going to get a win over one of our guys, this had to I be, know that we were ready to do that at that point. I, really? I, okay. Uh, it was, it was a story. It was one off. It was a major star like razor getting, getting beat by a kid, literally a kid. You know, and and that was, I think, goddamn, the fact that he, <laughs> you know, he did the one, the one, two, three kid, you know, the lightning kid before that, that you could refer to him as the kid, which I'll, I'll get into that later. But um, that was the story. It wasn't about Waltman. It was, it was not about Waltman at all. Had he was not, he was just the guy. It could have been anybody. He just happened to be the guy that night. That this wasn't a hey, we're gonna do this this story with this kid. The story was about Razor. Got the story it. was about Razor losing. Did you so think relatively unknown? Did you think eventually that would lead to a razor baby face turn? Or did you just assume this is another layer to this heel character we've got? I thought it was another layer to the heel character, which he which he did very well, but also, you know in the back of my mind, I'm, I'm pulling for Sean Waltman because I, again, I thought I, I always thought he was a tremendous talent from the day I met him. So you're hoping that, all right, if he pulls this off, then, you know, there could be more. Okay. Oh my right. God. I don't think I will never get to a program with him, <laughs> you know, but, um, it, it just worked. You know, the, the, this is an example of, of taking an opportunity and making the absolute most out of it. And that, that moment in time that flips the universe on its head for you personally, that, yeah, there, there, there was no, you know, big plan at that point. It was just guy for, for, for Razor to work with and to beat Razor, to infuriate Razor, that character. Talk to me a little bit about the, the post-show feeling. Like at this point, you've got a handful of Monday Night Raws under your belt, but, and I wasn't there, but I would guess with the excitement 
of Marty Jannetty coming back and beating Shawn Michaels. And then this unbelievable finish with Waltman and razor. It feels like when that is over, Mick Foley has talked a lot about, there's like this post-show euphoria you're on a high of, man, that was awesome. And you're sort of replaying it in your mind. Is this one of the first Monday night Raws you remember having that feeling where man, everything clicked tonight. I, I don't know. I, I tell you, I was ecstatic for kid. Yes. And there, there were a couple things to it. Um, I was happy to have Marty back. Yeah. But I, I was ecstatic for kid because what an ovation. And yeah. he was, I, he played it off. I didn't even know he was knocked out. I knew, I knew he was not silly in the match, but I didn't even know that he was that bad until uh, I got back after, after the show. So, you know, it, it's it's funny. You know, you, you hear guys talk about those kind of things. And I'm sorry, I'm multitasking. I have some people in um, in surgeries I'm waiting to hear about. I um, hope everybody's okay. Yeah, everything great. Good. So um, it, it's to a talent, hey, man, they may be euphoric and what have you. And, and, and when you have a really great night, you're happy. I think from our vantage point, a lot of times it's you have a really good night. Okay, next. <laughs> There's not time when you're doing when you're doing as much TV as as we were doing and and ramping up to do. There's not that there, there really isn't that time to high five and you know you go, okay hey great thank you man okay now what's next right because that's what you have to look at. I'm curious if you had to guess. Would you imagine that this would have been something Pat Patterson would have enjoyed this type of story? Oh, Pat yeah. loved it. Yeah. Yeah. Pat, Pat was, Pat was there for it. And Pat, yeah, Pat loved it. Uh, Dave Meltzer would write that as far as he can recall, this is the first time in WWF television history that someone has been given a win like this in this manner. The idea being that kid was basically squashed through the whole match, but then he hit that moonsault for the win and the big celebration. This is a departure from the normal way that these type of matches are done and really an interesting way to do it. Do you remember Scott Hall being at all hesitant about this concept or was he on board from right away? My recollection is Scott was on board right away. Yeah. It was again, you know, it's it's for though, you know, it turned into a story about one, two, three kid. We were able to make a character out of one, two, three kid. This is a happy accident. This story wasn't about Waltman. Right. Wasn't about the kid. It was about Razor. Razor, so fucking good that, you know, Razor, you know, made it about kid. And Razor made kid. Um, had it been anybody else that, that had not been the type of confident talent that, Scott Hall was, I don't know that they would have made the kid as well on the way there. So, you know, when you look back, hindsight, everybody goes, oh, God damn, this was a launch of it. What a great story. This one was an accident. This one was a fucking happy accident. A good one. You know, we're thinking, oh, hey, man, do you think you could ever have a rematch here? You know, you could do something like that. But it was... Um, that wasn't thought about beforehand because it was okay. This will be the story about Razor getting beat by the by the nobody. Holy shit, that doesn't happen. Well, you know what? We, you and I both, uh, I guess I did it first. We both got the the matches confused. That first match is not actually uh, where Sean takes the header and has the big bump. Let me explain. Waltman still has a tour of Japan booked. And if we've learned anything about the world wrestling federation is that when you come on board, the evil empire, if you will, they say, Hey man, finish up your other commitments, honor your word, do what you said you would do. So Waltman's off to Japan. And while he's in Japan, there's lots of challenges made on TV by razor Ramon, where he says, Sean Waltman is ducking him. And eventually he offers him $10,000 to accept this challenge. And it's actually Randy Savage, I believe who coins the phrase, the one, two, three kid on TV. At least he's the first person who says it on TV, but you think maybe it was the crowd who, who named him one, two, three, right? 
you go back, you listen to the audience chant yeah. one, yeah. two, three at Razor. Yes. They're yeah. chanting one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So from the audience's reaction of the one, two, three chant, that's how we came up with the name, one, two, three kid, Randy Savage saying it because it was the, it was the audience doing it. Had they not chanted one, two, three, and they didn't react at all, you wouldn't have a one, two, three kid. That's right. Well, June 21st, it finally happens. The return match for kid. It does a three rating, which is a hell of a rating at the time. And it's the big spot. Everybody remembers we were talking about earlier, the big slip off the top. Uh, of course, Sean is on the top rope coming down to the floor. He razors on the outside, but somehow Sean's feet slip. Bam. He nails himself, knocks himself out. They somehow get through the rest of the match. Somehow Sean Waltman hits the moonsault, grabs the money, hauls ass, takes off into a waiting car. I mean, this is really how you build a new star. I mean, look at that shot. If you're watching over on YouTube of razor standing on the street and away pulls the limo, man, the crowd is really, really with him. And then Ted DiBiase starts to rub it into razor's face about how he lost to the kid. And really cements, in my opinion, this is Razor's babyface turn. Um, Kid even comes back and gets a, a, a pin over DiBiase, continuing that build. How do you think he you was had at- something, man? It was it was good. It was in the moment. Yeah, you, you had a moment that you could then capitalize on. Do you think that? You know, I know that the fans sort of willed this because they got behind it and that's, oh, it works. Let's, let's give them more of that. I totally get that. But do you think that had this creative not taken off that maybe there would have been another opportunity for Waltman in the future? Or is this one of those timings, everything type stories? Uh, who knows? But timing is definitely everything in this particular case. Yeah. And, and again, as I said before, making the most out of the opportunity that is presented before you. Talk to me a little bit about how he's acclimating to the locker room. I mean, just to put this in perspective, my man is just 51 now. So when he's getting all of this moment in the sun here, this is 30 years ago. So he was 21 years old, not even old enough to rent a a, a rental car. And he finds himself in a grown ass man's business. And with all these guys, he's grown up watching on TV. He's certainly earning his spot, but man, that's got to be a hell of a acclimation process for a young person. No. Yeah. Big time. And I don't know that, that Sean always handled it the best. Um, at 21, how could you some point? Yeah. It's, it's tough and you're thrust, not, you know, look, man, not even being just, just imagine being in the business. Forget about everything else. Just being in the business. And as you said, you can't rent a car. You're 21 years old out there. <laughs> yes. You know, on your own. Um, so to heap on to that, aside, to, you, you got the immaturity of a 21-year-old kid who's like wide eyed and just, I just want to be one of the boys, man. I want to hang with my idols. I want to hang with the guys that you know, watched growing up to now they're doing something with him on TV and he's jumped over in the eyes of a lot of people, guys that have been there for a long time and guys that are older and feel much more deserving. So he has that heat on him, not understanding, at least I don't think the amount of heat that he really does have on him from everyone else, jealousy and just the way that he carries himself backstage because he's trying to act like a grown up. He's trying to act like, you know, the guys that he's watching act. Right. He's not there. Right. So there was a lot, there was a lot of resentment, a lot of heat and, and Sean was not, man, wasn't really welcomed with open arms, you know, at least from vantage point that I saw. And he had a a tough road ahead of him. Let's, uh, let's do another, uh, mention of IRS here. That's going to be the one, two, three kids. Very first pay-per-view at SummerSlam 93. Um, kid takes the loss from IRS. 
It does start to help build IRS for his series of intercontinental title matches against Razor. And I guess now Razor and Kid have formed some sort of bond on television. Do you think in real life they were traveling together already? Did they just hit it off in real life and became thick as thieves? Or did that take some time? Fairly quickly. Fairly quickly. And again, Scott, Scott saw potential. Scott liked him and wanted to help him, genuinely wanted to help him. So from the professional, hey, I'm going to help you, you know, get here with this story. Uh, they became friends outside and they probably were trying. I have no idea when, what the timeline of them becoming buddies and when they first kissed and all that shit. I have no idea, but um, they were friends. And I know Scott was definitely behind him, helping him in his career. Well, we know that kid gets some wins on TV. He's actually a part of the opening survivor series match teaming with Marty Jannetty, Razor Ramon and Randy Savage, who would go on to defeat IRS diesel, Rick Martell and Adam bomb kid. Marty were the last two survivors. And this would lead to them becoming a tag team. Where do you think the idea of putting these two guys together came from? Well, again, it was the, the youth thing and you had the kid and you had Marty um, Marty, in my opinion, is one of those guys better in a tag team. Yeah. So it was somebody that could help kid from a senior, you know, partner and, and someone that had experience and hopefully teach kid along the way in the tag team. So that, that was the only idea behind it. It was, you know, let's take them. They were both young. They both look good, both work the same style and hopefully Marty can teach him the good things in the business. Well, they had a good time together. They're going to become the tag team champs on the first anniversary of Monday night. Raw it happens January 10th, 1994. They're in Richmond, Virginia here. So by this point, we're no longer in the Manhattan center. We're taking the show on the road. They pick up a win over the Quebecers to become the tag team champs. It's only a one week, re- one week reign. And, uh, it's part of the story of the Quebecers building up to face Brett and Owen at the Royal rumble. Um, the Quebecers actually regained the titles uh, just a week later, January 17th. It's a Madison square garden house show. I mean, I know that we like to see title changes on house shows and try to boost that business, but it's also nice to get a title change on TV. We can check a lot of boxes here. Do you think had they actually made a a go of it, that could have been a viable long-term tag team Marty and Sean possibly. Uh, you know, we'll never know. Well, Bret Hart gets his first taste of the kid. Uh, they're going to be working some main events. That's right. Bret Hart is going to have some, uh, house show matches against Owen and Shawn Michaels in 94. Um, this is interesting, you know, that, that they're going to be a tag team against Owen and Shawn. I mean, this is the upper echelon of the entire organization. My dude is like, 20, 22 years old. I mean, not even at that point, he's still 21 years old and he's sharing the ring with Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels and Owen Hart. This, this era of WWE, maybe it wasn't setting box office records, but as far as the in ring stuff, you had some of the best damn wrestlers in the whole world here in the same ring at the same time with a young 21 year old Sean Waltman. Take a look at that photo too, Bruce in the bottom left hand corner. That looks like in this newspaper ad we're taking a look at. Looks like Sean Waltman is missing the old eyebrows. Do you remember hearing about that story? How that happened? Oh well, uh, there are many, but uh, <laughs> so uh, who, who who the hell really knows? But uh, look again, it was guys liked working with him. He's easy to work with. He's light. You could do anything with him. He could pretty much do anything, and had that you know, that story of being the guy that could upset people. So I thought that was, was pretty cool. And you could plug him into pretty much any situation again, which was nice. Let's, um, let's take a minute to talk about some of those hijinks. Uh, do you think that some of those ribs that guys were doing with Sean losing his eyebrows and whatnot, That's because he's the new guy. He's the young guy, all the above. He was the aggravating kid that annoyed the fuck out of everybody that, uh, thought he was, you know, 
one of the, one of the boys and it's just kind of look man it's just growing up and you know was it hazing is it uh so we used to call it in high school and i didn't even hear the word hazing good god until probably 20 years ago uh we called it sliming um oh i hadn't heard that well that's what we did in texas you, you get slimed um unless we had to push a penny down the hall with your nose and things oh. like that but that was kind of hazing i guess that that, that was done and and in this business, you know, was uh, kind of an initiation at points. Do you remember seeing the uh, the Hasbro figure of Sean Waltman? I have, I'm sure I have. I <laughs> well, what's interesting to me about it is we were talking about the eyebrows, and I didn't think they were perhaps in that newspaper ad, but I know for certain they weren't on the Hasbro box. And again, this is probably a guy who grew up playing with LJN action figures. And to know that all these years later, he's now part of the company, rubbing elbows with these guys. By God, I'm getting an action figure. And the day they do the photo shoots the night before, allegedly, maybe, perhaps, one of the nasty boys or what have you, shave those eyebrows off. So all these years later, John Waltman's action figure still has no eyebrows. On no, I think box. that's great. It's hilarious. It's just yeah. only in wrestling. Collector's items. Uh, absolutely. Kid misses out on wrestling at WrestleMania 10 due to the show running long. He's supposed to be a part of that 10 man tag that's cut due to time constraints. It's actually held on raw a few weeks later instead with IRS pinning kid. Uh, this has a, a hodgepodge of folks in there. The head shrinkers, Rick Martell, Jeff Jarrett, the smoking guns, Sparky plug to Tonka. I mean, it could have been a big opportunity for him. Of course, just to wrestle in Madison square garden. I mean, at a WrestleMania, doesn't happen. Got to be disappointment all around. Is, is there any words you can share with them, with them to make them feel better about having their spot cut besides, sorry guys, but you're still getting paid or is that it? Tough shit. Yeah. <laughs> no. Um, you know, that, that's the business. And sometimes, you know, look, you, you've got so, so long to go on if people, um, are selfish and take take up too much time. It affects other people. In in this case, there were, you know, a couple of matches in particular that took up too much time, way too much time. And looking at your show, and, and at that point on pay per view, you had to be, you had to be out by five minutes before the hour. I think it was that. I think this one was three hours or four hours. I really don't remember which. But you had to be out five minutes before that final hour for it to recycle and for them to actually re rewind the tape um there <laughs> and get it back up crazy but uh yeah it sucked not it was not not a lot of fun and and i'm the one that you know i took the headset off and i went over and i told all of them the news and apologized to everybody but um that point you just you know you, you move on next gotta fix it go it's crazy to think you know sean is is not going to be on wrestlemania 10 that match is going to be cut and it turns out he doesn't actually get to wrestle on a wrestlemania until wrestlemania 15 isn't that crazy to think about no i don't know it is to me it just feels like he's such a big part but yet you know his number but one it, again you know and, and it, it's it's not everybody can make all the big shows I'm not and, arguing and, that. And I'm if just... you do, but uh, again, uh, you may make the other big ones, but you may, may not make WrestleMania. You may make WrestleMania. You may not make SummerSlam. You may make SummerSlam. You might not make Survivor. That's just, it, it's tough. You know, it, it, it's, it's, it's tough. And um, that's just the way, you know, the ball bounces sometimes. And it doesn't, then it, you know, then, and I guess it, it, it affected, it did affect their pay. You know, they were paid for WrestleMania as if they were on it because they were booked on it. But I think that talent looks at it from a standpoint of prestige. Mm. You know, I want to be on WrestleMania. And anybody that gets into this business not wanting to be on WrestleMania shouldn't be in the business. So I appreciate that, man. And I, I, I get it. But, you know, not everybody can 
not everybody can be on it all the time. If there's not a story, if there's not a reason, then then you've got to make tough decisions. I just found it as an interesting trivia note, not arguing that he deserved a spot or didn't get a spot because I just assumed, oh yeah, he was like, if somebody would have said the first WrestleMania, Sean Waltman was on was WrestleMania 15. I would have said, wow, that can't be true. There's no way. But at the same time, I also know that a few years ago, I heard Razor Ramon was never in a Royal Rumble match, which sort of, well, yeah, of course he was. He had to be, but he had singles matches on those shows. Yeah. I, I just wouldn't have guessed that. See, I would have flunked that one. Yeah. Right. So like, you just, <laughs> yeah, I would, I would assume the same thing. Uh, well, kid winds up having a tremendous showing for the 1994 King of the ring tournament. He defeats Adam bomb to qualify on the May 28th edition of superstars. Then at the pay-per-view itself, kid beats Jeff Jarrett in the quarterfinals. Jeff then puts a beating on kid. And, uh, there's some doubt in fans minds as to whether or not kid would continue against Owen. He does return, but Owen beats him in about three and a half minutes with a sharpshooter. Uh, it's a short one, but man, it's fantastic. Worth watching again. If you haven't seen it in a while, it seemed like him and Owen just had natural chemistry, but that's probably true of them and almost any opponent, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, the curse is a good worker and they could work with anybody and make it look great. I love that. You called it the curse of the good worker. Not too long ago, Jeff Jarrett and I had that same conversation uh, about it. Sometimes you can be quote unquote, so good at making other guys look good that that becomes your, that's role. what you do. Yeah. And, and that's sort of the narrative that followed Sean Waltman around. At least if you read books or watch shoot interviews from back in the day, you would hear guys say that, man, Waltman was like the measuring stick for whether a guy was going to be able to make it with the WWE or not. He could go out and have a great match with anybody, but if he couldn't have one with you, then you sucked. Do you agree with that? That maybe he was a measuring stick there for a bit, the gatekeeper, no. if you will. No. Okay. Not necessarily. I, I think that, uh, I think that that opinion, you know, is shared as far as he pretty much could work with anybody. Um, but again, uh, that, that's a lot of guys, you know, I throw Owen in there. I throw, I, I throw Jeff Jarrett in there. I throw, um, Kurt Hennig in there, you know, there's on, on down the line that it's like, okay, if you can't, but you know what, that maybe they could with other people and, and work. So that wasn't something, Oh, can't, couldn't have a match with him. Then he's no good. But I think that was the narrative that was created, you know, later on. But I think that if you, you know, I would, uh, there were several guys that I'd always like to put in the ring with people. Uh, I mean, it, Brooklyn Brawler, you know, was okay. Come in, go in. And cause I knew how everybody worked with Brawler. How can you work with Brawler? Told me, told me a lot more than how can you work with a great worker? You know what I mean? Yeah. So it, it just depends. It, it, it's, it's, there's a lot of criteria there. The next night after this, uh, King of the ring kid wins a number one contenders match against Nikolai Volkov of all people. That's right. Nikolai Volkov was once upon a time in contention to be a number one contender. Uh, so kid always the number one contender. Nikolai. So throw that photo back up there again, Dave. I love this look for Nikolai. We don't spend a lot, enough time talking about him. Do you want to break out in song for him just one more time? <laughs> Nikolai was, uh, we were so lucky to have Nikolai at one of our very first live shows at Jimmy's Famous Seafood in Baltimore. Couldn't have been a nicer man. Got the biggest to-go bag of all time to go with him. Just a great dude. But that photo that Dave Silva just had up there where he's wearing sort of a million dollar man inspired outfit, except it's just a t-shirt. And instead of there being dollar signs on the lapel, it's the scent sign is perhaps one of the greatest outfits in the history of wrestling. I just absolutely love it. Nikolai, man, you know, and, and people, I think, you know, towards the end of Nikolai's career, always kind of looked at Nikolai as, uh, as this joke or something, man, this was a top, top guy in his day like yes. the tippy top and you know main evented with bruno everywhere when he was it was Beepo or guido mongol with uh bill Eady. 
Uh, but everywhere he went, he was a top, top guy. And then later on, you know, with Iron Sheik as the, the, that foreign menace tag team um, was just unbelievable, man. You know, and, and uh, <laughs> as Ernie Lyle would say, he was always the shits, but by God, he was real. Uh, it was, he did whatever he asked him to do, man. He had the same, uh, what was the color? Burgundy suit with yellow pinstripe. Ever since I'm, ever since I knew him until the day he died, they probably buried him in it. Um, but he, he, he lived, uh, lived in Baltimore and red meters as his day job oh, wow. later, on, later on in the, in his career when he wasn't working as much. And when he only worked on weekends, he, he was a meter reader, um, like go to your house and read the gas meter, or electricity meter on your house back before computers and stuff. Kids, they had human beings go and collect the data in person. Then just go up on there and, and type type a few things in and get all that information and shit. You had to go there and see it yourself. That's what Nikolai did. That just blew your mind right there about that. That people went in, in real life and read the meters at your house. And then just, you know, there was something wrong in your house. They came out and fixed it. They just didn't get on their computer and fix it. The good old days. The good old days. So let's talk about what happens here. Uh, you want to guess who won this number one contender? Between Nikolai and uh, Kid? One, two, three, Kid? Yeah. I hope Nikolai won. Ah, uh, damn it. Sorry to disappoint you. It was one, yeah. two, three, Kid. So now it's going to be, he gets a shot against Brett the Hitman Hart on the July 11th Monday Night Raw from Bushkill, Pennsylvania. And man, it doesn't disappoint. A lot of people were saying it may have been the best match on Monday Night Raw up until that point. Brett eventually gets the win with the sharpshooter, but they got 25 minutes to do this. Go out of your way to see it, especially if you've never seen it before. This guy's proven himself, man, against great wrestlers. I'm sure Sean and Brett absolutely loved wrestling him. I know Owen had to. I mean, he's got uh, the respect of these guys at this point, no? It's a night off. Yeah. He <laughs> get in the ring with the kid. It's a night off. He's flip flopping and flying all over the place, and he wasn't a flip flopping flyer. I don't mean that mean it that way, but he would be bumping all over the place for you, make you look like a million bucks. So yeah, I've guys loved working with him and everything, and and guys like so for example, Brett. Brett could have gone out and beat him in five minutes, but it's like no, let me have a match with him, and because it was good, it was entertaining, you know. Kid could do any and everything. Let's uh, let's talk about October. It's the second edition of Action Zone. It was taped in White Plains. It's a match that people are still talking about uh, every now and again. At least once a year, I'll see people talking about this one. It's an incredible match on WWF TV in a time when it was mostly enhancement matches, especially on Action Zone. But this is where Sean and Razor are going to team up to take on the tag champs, Diesel and Shawn Michaels. So this is the click wrestling themselves. And there's been a narrative that when they were all out there together, man, they would go all out and, uh, they make no exception here. 22 minutes, a big boot to the face from diesel is what ends it for the one, two, three kid. But my goodness, big friends here having a big time match, 22 minutes. Uh, do you remember being impressed in particular with this? Is this one of those matches that they're trying to show out for Vince or what do you recall? I I don't. I'm sorry. I just, I don't. Uh, but I'm sure it was excellent. You know, I recall the Brett one, um, but, you know, I'm sure it was excellent. And the fact that it was for action zone means that I was probably doing something else while, while it was taking place. But um, I'm sure it was excellent. Look, look at the workers in there. And it was all guys that enjoyed each other personally, which yeah. always helps, man. If you're, in the, if you're in the ring with your buddy, you're going to sell more. You're going to do more. And it's going to be a lot more fun. And when you're having fun, you do your best work. 
the photo that we've just seen there is actually from survivor series 94 it's the opener kids a part of that where razor's the sole survivor the rest of his team which is kid the head shrinkers and davy boy smith are all eliminated uh sean then accidentally hits the sweet chin music on diesel for the third time in as many months causes the team to lose here and the split of sean and diesel uh, sean and diesel are still the tag champs when they split up so those titles wind up being vacated uh so now we're going to have in late 94 an eight-man team tournament or eight team tournament to set up uh new champions um do you remember at any point in 93 you're certainly 94 sean becoming becoming what you might call a problem for talent relations like i know that there's hijinks and ribs and you said he was a cocky kid and blah 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 but was there ever something where we had to have like a serious heart to heart about, Hey man, don't waste this opportunity. Or was he keeping it between the ditches for the most part? Walton? Yeah. No, I think there was, there was a little concern again, you know, it's to my knowledge, you don't know that Sean ever really partied or drank heavily or did, you know, anything kind of outside the lines uh, until he came in and kind of hooked up with everybody and discovered, new things so i i think that you know it was kind of in this i don't remember the exact time frame but sounds about right where he was feeling his oats sowing his oats feel what are you feeling are you i know you sow your oats what do you do with what do you do with your feels uh maybe you take them to game time and you get some great tickets at the very last minute that's what i do bruce well when i'm looking to get someplace where i can't go and it was hard it's always best to go to game time, especially at the last minute. You're going to get the absolute best deal possible. You know, what we like about game time is they make it easy. You know, so often tickets go on sale and man, life gets in the way. We miss it. And if you have a kid who has wanted to see Taylor Swift, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You have to get in line and there's a queue and there's different reservations. And you're like holding your fingers crossed there. No whammy, no whammy, no whammy. And then you get this big seat map and you wonder, is that a good view? Will, will this be a good seat? I, I don't really know. And if you go to some of those other sites, you don't really know if you're getting the best price possible. That's why we recommend game time. Don't worry about the stress of forgetting when tickets go on sale. You can get last minute tickets as most recent as the same day. How about that? Buy tickets today and go tonight, two taps and bam, it's in your phone. You don't even have to dig through your email. But not only that, they give you a seat preview. So you can actually take a look at this app and see like, oh, here's my perspective from that seat. Oh yeah, that's a great seat. I want that one. But I know what you're thinking. Well, how do I know I'm getting a good deal? Where well, that's where the game time guarantee comes in. You see what they're gonna do is they're gonna make sure you always get the best price. Let me explain. If you find tickets in the same section, in the same row for less money, game time will credit you 110% of the difference. And they're not just doing this on wrestling tickets, y'all. They'll do it on football, baseball, basketball, concerts, comedy, theater. If they're selling tickets to it, Game Time's probably got it. And why would you not buy from them? You got that Game Time guarantee where you know you're getting the best price and you can do it the day of. Snag the tickets without the stress with Game Time. Just download that Game Time app, create an account, and use the code WRESTLE for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code WRESTLE for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. So listen, everybody needed tickets to see who was going to win these tag titles. Of course, the smoking guns were supposed to be in the tournament, but there's an injury suffered by Billy Gunn. So they're going to be replaced by a new makeshift tag team of Bob Holly and the one, two, three kid. They go on to defeat well done in the corner finals on January 7th on superstars. And then the heavenly bodies the following week. And now they're in the finals against Bam Bam Bigelow and Tatanka. That all goes down at the Royal Rumble pay per view. And somehow, some way, Kid and Holly pull off the big upset. They win the tag title. So this is going to be Sean's second time winning the tag titles with a different opponent. No Marty Gennetti, this time with Bob Holly. Uh, this is uh, a really, really fun story. And by the way, this helps set the stage. For Bigelow and Lawrence Taylor, Sean Waltman finds himself in a cool spot here again, being reliable to have good matches. That's paying off for our man here, isn't it? Always pays off. Again, you know, <laughs> if, you, if you're a great worker and by God, you can go out there and deliver, then 
that's a good spot to be in, whether you're winning or losing. By God, you don't pay the same, Connie. There you go. Well, Marty Jannetty was a tag team champ with Sean Waltman for a whole seven days. And I know what you're thinking to yourself. You're saying to yourself, self, how long was Bob Holly a tag I, team? I, I, and you know what I would say to that? I what? said, man, those guys are one dayers. Well, you nailed it because they drop it the next night on Raw. The, the guns are back. They're going to win the titles from Kid and Holly. I'm sure they were, uh, I mean, listen, you're going to back into this. Why not give them a feel good moment on the pay-per-view and then we'll get back on track the next night. Kid does suffer a handful of in injuries in early 95, including a concussion and unbelievably a fractured vertebrae. So he's going to be away for a few months to heal up. Uh, is that inevitable when you're working his style or you're his size or you're working in these rings on that schedule? What would all you talk about? Yeah. Fuck yeah, man. All the above. It, it, you know, those crazy bumps catch up with you after a while. Yeah. And you know, it was just catching up with him. So you add that to the schedule to to everything else. And yes, it's going to take its toll, man. And, and eventually you need to stop. And the only... Uh, the only thing you can do is rest. Sometimes your body just needs to rest and heal and allow itself to regenerate and go on from there. Body's an incredible, incredible thing. Let's, uh, let's mention that kid is back in the ring in June. And unfortunately he loses to the roadie at the July in your house pay-per-view. It's a pretty scary looking pile driver off the middle turnbuckle, which I don't think I've seen very often. Thankfully, not too many times since. Uh, he would also lose to Hakushi at SummerSlam. Do you think at this point, maybe the one, two, three kid persona had run its course? Was it time for a heel turn? Did he think that? Did you think that? Well, he's a natural heel. In real life, you mean? In real life, but also he, he is a natural heel in the ring, too. I mean, he's a natural, cocky, arrogant, you know, kid. That's how he comes across. Yeah. A punk so, kid, a punk kid. Yes. Yeah. So following SummerSlam, we begin what I guess you might call is like a slow burn process to turn kid heel. He's going to lose to Dean Douglas by DQ after razor interferes. Kid's going to argue with razor after the match for costing him the match. And on raw two days later, kid costs razor a match against bulldog by DQ. And after the match, Vince McMahon does an in-ring interview with both razor and kid. And kid is going to dismiss McMahon's questions about the match and instead challenge razor to a match the following week so that razor will finally take him seriously and give him respect. And after the kid leaves ringside razor said, he's the one who made the kid famous. And if that's the fans, if that's the match, the fans want and McMahon makes it here we go. He's going to accept the challenge. I mean, he's always been positioned as like this scrappy underdog. This is really the first time we see something different from Sean. Was he excited to show this side of his persona, if you will? I think so. I think so. I just think he was more comfortable in that skin. Yeah. So it was, it was, didn't have to try as hard. Well, a week later, what do you know? Kid beats Razor Ramon again. This time it's after some interference from Dean Douglas kid. And, uh, uh he makes sure that the referee is distracted. And we don't see the interference from Dean Douglas. And um, this feels like kid is maybe a backdrop for the eventual Dean Douglas program. We could probably do a whole episode about Dean Douglas might be a short episode. Uh, but is that one of the great misses? Do you think of that era? Like what's that Dean Douglas? Do you think it was the gimmick or was he just not ready for the WWF at that time? In your opinion? I mean, I love Shane Douglas in WCW and enjoyed his work in ECW, but the Dean Douglas character, eh, maybe not so much. Uh, I, I just don't think that Shane was ready at that time. Just really that timing. For, for, I, I don't know, man. I, I just don't know if it was a personality conflict, just timing, whatever the hell it was. Uh, Shane didn't click. And in your house on September 24th from Saginaw, Dean is going to pin Razor. This time, Razor is distracted by Kid. Razor hits the Razor's edge as the referee, Tim White, is knocked down. Uh, Kid then appears and, and counts a pinfall himself. After Razor then realizes the referee is not the one making the pin, 
He shoves kid out of the ring to avoid getting disqualified. And he's wound up being caught from behind by Dean after the match razor pulls kid in the ring where you can see these guys pushing each other back and forth, slapping each other around referees and officials break it up. Could you have seen this being built and, and paying off at like a major pay-per-view, like a WrestleMania type program? I mean, they were synonymous with each other from kids. first. Kid razor? Sure. Yeah. I could see that. Yeah. Definitely. I, there's just so much real rich history there. The, the Definitely something that could go all the way. They have a rematch against each other on October 2nd to try to settle these differences. Razor pins kid three separate times. He originally wins the match with a clothesline, but kids demand it demands that the, the match continue. Uh, Razor pins him the second time, catching him coming off the ropes and hitting a power bomb. Once again, kid wants a rematch. Now it's the third time. Inside cradle gets it done for Razor. Kid wants to keep going, and they somehow have their bodies give out, or, or or kid does. Razor, I guess, maybe respects that, and they leave ringside together. What do you think of that story? That he just won't give up, and damn it, because you didn't give up, I respect you too. Okay, we're pals now. Is that an old school story or what? Tell you a story. It's a true story. Look. Not gonna mention any names here or anything like that. But I know someone who like uh, fought with their brother. Okay. Let's say it's their brother. And the brother whipped their ass and told them to go to bed. Don't come out anymore. Or else I'm gonna whip your ass again. That kid went to bed. About 15 minutes later, came back out. Fought their brother again. Got their ass whooped a second time. This time, the brother took him, put him in the bedroom and said, stay in here, don't come out, or else I'm going to whip your ass and you're going to really regret it. That kid sat in there maybe five minutes this time and said, fuck that. Came out, maybe as they walked down that hallway, maybe their brother was eating a bowl of cereal and his had a bowl of cereal. He had that spoon in his mouth and looked up and saw that kid coming down that hallway for a third time. Dropped that spoon and got up, whipped that kid's ass so bad. Took him in their bedroom and put him to bed. Literally put him to bed. Pulled the covers up. So stay here. I said, I'm gonna fucking kill you. And that time, that third time, <laughs> third ass woman was the one just enough for that, that kid to think about it and stayed in that bed till the next morning. So, yeah, I can imagine something like that happened. Did you ever mess with Tom again, or was that the last time? Um. So, I was... I mean, well, no, let's just say that hypothetically the kid was uh, <laughs> 14, 15. Okay. And he probably learned his lesson at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Well, good to know, I guess. Yeah, I'm just saying. I so Allegedly. It could happen. Yeah, you've heard. No, it was hypothetical. It's like, it's like one of those yeah. uh, Aesop, Aesop's fables or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good life lesson. Kid brother Razor your ass fat enough to put you to bed. Stay there. Because brothers do fight. Because brothers sure as fuck do fight. Yeah, yeah they do. Oh. Uh, Kid and Razor get a shot at the smoking guns and the tag straps at the next in your house. It's October 22nd. Ramon does the Razor's Edge on Billy and stalls around while Kid is begging for the tag so he could win the title. After more stalling, Ramon tags Kid who goes in for a cocky pin, but Billy winds up crucifixing him to the mat and they retain the titles. And after the match, Kid is throwing an absolute temper tantrum, shoving Razor, walking out on him, attacking both guns, and to cement the heel turn on November 13th on Raw, Kid has made the special guest referee of a non-title match between Razor and Sid for the IC title. Sid's controlling a lot of the match because Douglas is attacking Ramon early when Kid, quote unquote, doesn't see. Ramon makes a comeback, has Sid in the Razor's edge, but Kid breaks up the move. 
Sid then power bombs Ramon and kid gives a very fast three count. Ted DiBiase then stuffs money in Ramon's mouth. Kid takes some money from Ramon's mouth and leaves with Sid and DiBiase. So it's official. The one, two, three kid has turned his back on razor Ramon. He's now taking the money from the evil million dollar man. And six days later in his first match as a heel officially, I suppose he's the sole survivor in the opening elimination match at survivor series. Kid's going to defeat former party, former uh, partner, Marty Janetti. Well, he had Marty, win. right? It was from former Marty, Marty. Marty, yeah. Marty. Yeah. Okay. There you go. I mean, listen, it, it's a big deal. We, we've mentioned that he's not for whatever reason on the WrestleMania cards, but buddy, it feels like these freaking survivor series matches. That's his wheelhouse. That's what he's made for man. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah Cause he can work with everybody and you can plug him into plug him into things and it was going to work. Uh, kid's going to go on to cost uh, razor Ramon, the intercontinental title. Uh, he drops it to gold dust at the Royal rumble pay-per-view in January of 96. And the next night on raw kid interferes in razors match with triple H and sprays razor with milk from a large baby bottle. Is this right out of the brain of uh, Jim Cornette? This feels a little smoky mountain. Captain. <laughs> put him in a diaper and a bonnet. Yeah. It sets up the uh, crybaby match between Razor and Kid at the February 96 in your house pay per view from Louisville. Razor Ramon's going to pin one, two, three, Kid in a crybaby match. Huh. 12 minutes and one second. Kid comes out with a stroller. Ramon has a teddy bear. Ted DiBiase is going to throw baby powder in Ramon's eyes to give Kid an advantage. Because it's a baby match, by God. They got to use baby powder. You can't use damn adult powder. Ramon puts the baby bottle in kid's mouth, throws powder in DiBiase's eyes, puts a diaper on kid, pours baby powder all over him. Kid is going to be revived in the ring. He's going to start crying. Uh I'm sure this is one of Sean Waltman's favorite moments in WWF. I would hope so. Yeah. I would think it would be. I mean, I know the business has changed and it was certainly evolving in 96, but my goodness, were you ever an advocate of the crybaby match? Absolutely. It's entertainment, man. Yes, it's great. And and I'm serious when I say, I bet you that it is one of Waltman's favorite moments in his entire career. You know, like one of my favorite moments that I actually have it up on my wall is Roddy Piper putting me in a diaper and bringing me out on a rope. It It was entertainment. That's good shit. It's things people don't forget. Now, that's what we're here to do. We're not here for our own ego. And, oh, God, I've got to look strong. I've got, no, man, shit. It was entertaining. It was great. Well, I think uh, the wheels are starting to come off on Kid. One of his last WWF appearances is him wrestling Mark Mero and, at the pre-show for the April 96 In Your House in Omaha. Meltzer would say, Kid physically looked bad. His work was sloppy and he was way down in weight. He appears to be in the 165, 170 range. He winds up wrestling his final WWF match of this run two days later against Savio Vega. Then unfortunately he's put into a drug rehabilitation program afterwards, Uh, but he doesn't return. And instead he's actually let go. And the timing of this is curious, of course, because this is right after WrestleMania where we're, we're going to know for sure that razor and, and diesel are leaving and they're heading to WCW chat me up. Is this just bad timing for Waltman? I mean, his pals are leaving, he's in rehab. He's had some troubles. Uh, it just feels like there's a, a lot of bad luck right now for Mr. Waltman. Well, I, again, it was, you know, fighting his demons and they were rearing their ugly heads. So, you know, Sean was having issues, man. Sean was definitely having problems. So it wasn't uh, just, yeah, it wasn't a good time for him. I believe he was having issues with his family and might have been going through a divorce or something like that at the time. But it was uh, it was definitely not a good time for Sean. Let's, um, let's mention that you guys wind up letting him go. How do you remember that going? Does he ask for the release? Do you guys offer the release? What's that look like? We know he debuts in September for WCW, but 
between April here and September, there's eight months. Uh, what do you remember how that all came to be? So I don't remember all the particulars other than it just, you know, it, it wasn't going to work. And I don't think that Sean wanted to stay. And I don't think that Sean felt that he needed help either. And I'm not sure that he completed his rehab. He may have, I, I don't recall, honestly. Um, so it just, you know, you know, circumstances, if you will. So it was just time maybe that we best part ways. Let's uh, let's talk about what we see in WCW. He's going to show up as six S Y X X, which a lot of people would say, Oh, it's because he's the sixth member of the NWO. And other people would say, well, it's actually what you get when you add together one, two, and three, like the one, two, three kid. I know that you guys are in a legal battle at the time about the likenesses of diesel and razor Ramon with certainly the uh, stubble and the slick back hair and the accent and all that, that Sean was doing. And maybe we were trying to create confusion in the marketplace, if you will. Do you think you guys had an issue with six S Y X X or was that just a cute way to get around it? I guess I was cute. I, we didn't have an issue with that. No. Well, let's talk about October of 97, just 13 months later, a neck injury sidelines Waltman from wrestling. He's going to continue to appear on TV while he's at home recuperating. He's fired by FedEx from Eric Bischoff and Waltman would claim that this was a power play aimed at his friends, Hall and Nash and Bischoff later would say that Waltman was a competent performer when sober, but sober periods were quote few and far between. And another quote from Eric at the time, in many ways, Sean was lucky to even have a job. So listen, we know that that proved out to not be the case. I'm sure this is just Eric venting frustration and he's still embroiled in this battle and war with you guys. But when you first hear that Waltman was let go and that's October of 97, knowing that he had left you and we'll call it May or June of 96. What'd you think? Like, Hey man, this is an opportunity to, to land a coup. Somebody coming back this way. Why was he worth a, a roll of the dice? If you will. Well, he wasn't right away. You know, it was talked about, but it, it wasn't a decision right away to do that. Um, over time, you know, and all the issues that we were having with Sean and looking at the future as far as, okay, now Sean's gone. You got Steve here and, and you've got Hunter and the New Age Outlaws and God damn, what, you know, what are you, what are you going to do? Um Turned out, you know, it was a nice thing, somebody coming back the other way. But that that wasn't overnight. That definitely was not overnight. Sean had to prove himself and just, I think, you know, people were like, get your act together. Get everything together at home and and prove that, that you've grown up and matured a little bit before we do anything with you. Well, what a moment it is, man. He comes back the night after WrestleMania 14. And I think a lot of fans, myself included, would continue this to be the first night where Monday after WrestleMania became a thing. He's going to come back, not as the one, two, three kid, but as X Pac. And he joins DX in a very memorable promo. It all starts when Triple H says he's forming a DX army. And when you start an army, you look to your blood, you look to your buddies, you look to your friends, you look to the click. He signals to the entrance way and here he comes Sean Waltman sporting a full beard, a DX t-shirt, sunglasses, wagging that tongue around. And Jim Ross says, look, who's back. A new day is dawning for DX. Apparently there's a new leader in DX. Waltman leaps into the ring, climbs the ropes. Fans are popping huge for this. And this promo man, he's letting everybody have it. He's dumping on Hulk Hogan, Eric Bischoff, WCW saying that his friends would wish they were here too, but they're being held hostage. It's a new day for DX and really the whole WWF, just an awesome promo. And I don't think we ever saw this type of promo before from Sean Waltman. Were you shocked watching this on a monitor? Like, holy shit, where was that? This is fantastic. Yeah. Again, before that name, one shot, Sean Waltman promo. That's right. Yeah. And this one wasn't good by any stretch of the imagination it's remembered because of the content not the delivery or anything else yes um so but at the same time i think it's it's historic 
from the point of, you know, somebody else coming from the other side. And this was the turning point. This now is where people are going, you know, we just had Tyson and all this other uh, what have you. And now it's like, all right, you want to play big boy? Let's go play. And uh, we started to play. Man, it was awesome. I mean, later that same night, Hunter, China, and X-Pac are going to help the New Age Outlaws win the tag straps from Cactus Jack and Terry Funk in a cage match. I mean, these guys have been, DX has been the most hated heel faction for, I don't know, six months at this point. And now very quickly, they're going to become super over baby faces. They're going to start invading WCW and the CNN Center. They're going to mock the nation. I mean, Sean Waltman is such a big part of these big moments. 25 years ago throughout 1998. And I think all these years later, you know, Eric Bischoff has said the, the, he was the, uh, the straw that stirred the drink for DX in his opinion. He had this edginess. He was cool. He was one of the first guys to come from the NWO back over to the WWF. He felt like Waltman was really the secret sauce of this second version of DX. Would you agree with that? Mm, no, I think that he was, uh, I think he was an important ingredient, but I think it was, I think it was timing. And I think that it was just the, the overall combination. There wasn't any one. I, I think that we would have done just the same without him. I think having him definitely added big time to DX and big time to the product, but I don't know that it was that that was the turning point. I think it was the DX. I think it was, the way that we handled it, you know, the invasions that we did in the non-traditional way that DX was presented in the things that they did. Yeah, I loved this version of Sean, but what's crazy to think about is he wasn't wrestling all the time. I mean, there's probably some hesitancy because he was seriously injured. I mean, when you have these type of injuries, it's not something you rush back from, but eventually he does start to get an opportunity to do some in-ring stuff, a feud moves on to Jeff Jarrett and Southern justice. Somehow, some way Sean Waltman winds up with Jeff Jarrett in a hair versus hair match at SummerSlam inside of Madison square garden. So man, he may have had his WrestleMania 10 match scrapped, but that was a 10 man tag. He's back in the garden on pay-per-view with the business much hotter than it was in 1994, this time in a hair match and maybe the most the memorable part. hair match in the fucking history of the business. I put it up there with the bullshit that Watts pulled in uh, in Houston with Duggan and Hernandez and bringing another guy in to shave their head. Why was it shitty? Didn't shave his head. Just gave him a haircut. Gave him a haircut made him look better. Yeah. I hated it. Hated it. I was livid. You loved Howard Finkel being involved, though. I, I okay. did like Howard being involved. Yeah. But look at Howard. Howard was bald. Sure. It was a head shaving match. They didn't shave anything. They cut a little bit of hair and then gave him a great haircut when he came back. And seriously, made him look a lot better than he did. The idea of a head shaving match is to shave the head bald. That's what the promos were. That's what people were expecting. They didn't get that. I felt it was a shitty finish. I felt it was a shitty conclusion and just, um, yeah, I didn't like it. Well, you're firm on your stipulations if there's hair. No, I, I am. I really am. I don't know why. It's a Texas it's weird. Thing. Yes. It is. It's it's like, man, it's that Texas thing in that I remember, so, you know, it's like a mask. You know, loser has to unmask. Loser has to get their head shaved. Then shave their head bald. And, you know, is in, in and maybe it's just my age, but it's um, growing up. You know, you didn't have a lot of bald people like you do. People shave their head now because they want to shave their head. They like it. Yeah, yeah. But there, there wasn't a plethora of bald people growing up. There weren't. And when a guy had long hair and when you would make a big deal out of, oh, my God, my long, beautiful, flowing blonde hair and it's so great. And I, it takes me all this time to get ready because I got to fix my hair. Then you take that identity away from somebody. It meant something. And this was built up. Oh, I'm humiliating people, shaving their head. And in Jeff's, you know, promos, it was, I'm humiliating people by shaving their head. But then when it comes time for his humiliation, 
he gets a haircut. Well, here's what I know. When it comes to shaving, if you want to do the right job, Manscaped can help. And and that would have been perfect because the shears there would have worked better than anything possible. We're talking about the Beard Hedger Pro Kit. That's right. They're not just doing your ball bag anymore. Now they're taking care of those facial hair fantasies. This is a real game changer. Use our promo code STW over at manscaped.com. You'll get 20% off plus free shipping. I want to mention it includes in this Beard Hedger Pro Kit, a cordless trimmer with a rotary wheel that's got 20 different hair cutting links with just one guard. No more messy drawers filled with add-ons. It's also waterproof, so do it in the shower. You can avoid all that hair in the sink. They've got a titanium coated T-blade, which is smooth on hair, or tough on hair rather, but smooth on your face. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to take care of your face. And what better way to do that than beard shampoo and conditioner. It's gonna help you moisturize, reduce those ingrown hairs, replace those natural oils. Speaking of oils, you can get the Manscaped Beard Oil in this kit as well. It'll go ahead and uh, smooth that skin out underneath, relieve some dryness and add a little shimmer and shine while we're at it. How about the Beard Balm? Help you shape that beard, get a cool little look. Sculpt it out, daddy. How about three free gifts too? Beard brush, comb, and scissors. I use all three, absolutely love them. They're all included in the Pro Beard Kit here. If you've got facial hair, man, you need the Manscaped Beard Hedger Pro Kit. What are you waiting for? Get 20% off with free shipping using our code STW at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. Use the code STW, Manscaped Beard Hedger, one stroke, one guard, 20 links. Uh, let's get back to it. Well, go back. Yeah, let's go back. You ought to ask Jeff Jarrett and I, uh, see if he remembers. Um, because as soon as he came back and, you know, what'd you think? I said, that's a fucking shit. God, it pissed me off. Sorry, but yeah, I'm a little particular on my hair matches. No, I get it. I like it. You have a uh, passion for your because sister. they always like in, uh, they always drew back in the day, and, and I know it's 2023. It's not 1978 anymore. Well, back in 1998, Xbox beat D'Lo Brown for the European title, but he lost it back two weeks later, and then regained it another two weeks later at Judgment Day. Uh, Waltman, for better or worse, is firmly placed in the mid card. I mean, listen, sign a small contract. He's coming in in 1998, in the middle of the Monday Night Wars. I'm sure he's making just a pile of cash. Eventually, China turns on DX and joins the corporation the night after the Royal Rumble in 1999. That sets up the St. Valentine's Day Massacre, where China and Kane are going to defeat Triple H and X-Pac after X-Pac was distracted by Shane McMahon. And the next night, Shane would become the European champion. But it's in a tag match with Shane and Kane taking on X-Pac and Triple H with an extra added stipulation that if X-Pac is pinned, whoever gets the fall would become European champion. Well, Shane gets the pin after a little help from China. At this point, do you think DX had sort of run its course? No, I think there were still legs. I think that you kind of needed that DX (laughs) 2.0. That was still several years off. Um but I, I felt there was still legs, but I think Hunter really wanted to go out on his own, you know, and kind of get away from the DX thing. And um, I, I don't know that the talent had their heart in it anymore. Let me ask you this. I've never really thought about this, but I want to ask now. I would imagine in this era, uh, we'll call it May, June, July of 98, after these guys are invading the CNN center and mocking the nation, I bet DX merch is just flying off the shelves. It's gotta be one of your yeah. top. So I assume that everybody gets cut in everybody. Who's a part of the group gets a little piece. Why not roll Todd? That makes sense to me. Right. But now when Waltman gets kicked out of the group and Shane's in it, does Waltman lose his spot of that royalty for DX at that point forward? I don't really know how if they did do, if they did new merchandise, he probably would have. But oh, I see. Have, but if it's an old skew, probably would have on the uh, original stuff. Yeah, I got you. So the old skews, it's the same cut new stuff. I got it. Okay. That makes sense. Uh, Xbox finally gets his first match at WrestleMania. We teased it earlier. It's WrestleMania 15. He's going to be challenging Shane for the European title prior to the match. Triple H would defeat Kane with a little help from China. And she seemingly rejoined DX, but it's a swerve, bro. 
as Triple H is going to cost X Pac the match here versus Shane. Triple H has really joined the corporation, and Kane has been removed, and DX has basically disbanded. Uh, there was never really a big blow off of, of Hunter turning on DX or a Hunter versus X Pac match. That never really takes place. Why do you think that was? I think just, you know, I think Hunter was just looking to move on, kind of move up, establish himself as, as a single and not part of group anymore. Well, so now you're wondering, well, what's X Pac going to do? He's going to befriend Kane. And just two days after WrestleMania, which I guess airs six days later on Raw. The oddball tag team is going to defeat Owen Hart and Jeff Jarrett to become the tag champs. So this is now, uh, Sean with yet another random tag partner, Marty Gennetti, Bob Holly, now Kane. It's a little weird, but I dug it. It kind of worked for me. What do you I think? loved, I loved Kane and X-Pac. It's fun. They, they were complete opposites and, and it was, it was fun. It was, it, you know, Kane does the big man stuff. X Pac does the normal man stuff. It was it was good stuff. I thought it was entertaining as hell. Uh, the acolytes would win the tag titles on the May thirty first edition of Raw, following the interference from Shane McMahon before Pac goes on a run in the ninety nine King of the Ring tournament. It's built around the last three members of DX, as Waltman would defeat Road Dog in the semifinals before losing to Billy Gunn in the main event. I got to say from the outside looking in, it does feel like Waltman's baby uh, treading water a little bit here at the fully loaded pay-per-view in July of 99. We got X-Pac and Road Dog defeating China and Mr. Ass for the rights to the DX name. Did you ever think Road Dog and X-Pac could capture or recapture maybe what the New Age Outlaws had? No. Just the, the chemistry wasn't no. there? I just, you know. Timing. Yeah, you know, it was like draws and uh, LOD. It's just, it, it, it's LOD was LOD, man. It was, it was, it's hard to replace, and especially when, when the other talents are still active. Let's, um, let's mention the August 9th Raw. We would see Kane and X Pac regain the tag titles from uh, the Acolytes. X Pac had been trying to, I guess we'd say humanize Kane prior to this, including trying to help him speak his first few words in character, uh, without the help of a, a device. And after winning the titles, I have two words for you, Bruce. Give it to me as Kane doing that gimmick. Go ahead. What, what do you think he said? What are the two words? It's DX. And that how I did it. No. I'd like to think. Come on, enunciate a little more. Give me another cane, suck it. I'm doing it. It's the device. I mean, I can't. I... <laughs> Don't you know when you got something in your neck, it's hard to say. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But yeah, I know. I do know. I do know. They lose the tag titles before DX could reform as a heel stable <laughs> in October doing? of 99. I don't know what we're doing. Um, you know, a heel stable of DX, October of 99, the bloom's off the rose here. It's not the same, right? It's not. Yeah. It's really not. Uh, the storyline between Kane and X Pac is going to become personal. Uh, they're portrayed as much more than just tag team partners, but now they're friends trying to help each other become the best versions of themselves. And their feud only intensifies when Kane's girlfriend, Tori leaves him for X-Pac, which sends Kane on the war path looking for revenge. And this is maybe the, uh, the heel version of Sean as X-Pac that I enjoyed the most, uh, after Kane had lost a match where the stipulation was Tori had to spend the Christmas holidays with X-Pac if Kane didn't win. But upon returning, Tori said X-Pac was the perfect gentleman. Uh, fast forward to January, and on SmackDown, Tori has officially well, turned up or anything like that. His gimmick, you mean? No, he's burned up. Yeah. Do you think Kane's wiener got roasted in that fire, if you had to guess? It was covered, wasn't it? I, I wasn't at the fire. I don't remember. No, why? Well, look, I think every every place where Kane's not covered up, he's you know he's he, he's burned up. He's burned up. I got you. It's a bad fire in the funeral home. That Paul yep. Bear just you know, evil man. No doubt. 
But I thought Kane set the fire. Paul Bearer told him to. Oh, breaking news right there for all the clickbaits. And then, you know, he got burned himself, which, you know. Taught him a lesson. You know, well, I would hope so. Don't play yeah. the fire, kids. But he did every time he came to the ring. What would he do with his hands to make the fire come out? Can you show us? Fuck you. You know, I can't lift my shoulder. I can do it one hand there. The one side that's, of the ring. You know what, man? That's fucked up. You're, <laughs> you're seeing me. I got it. It's immobilized. It's here. It's good. I, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, Tori officially turns on Kane. <laughs> Join X Pac. One arm K. Yeah. Uh, what does Kamala's penis say? Yeah. Very similar, just in the front with a squirt at the end. Yeah. Uh, so listen. And even when I first did that idea, you you got to do this too with it. That's that's when you know it's finished. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, listen. the The big secret is what did they really do during the holidays? Um. This is happening at the same time the whole Stephanie and Hunter storyline is happening. Is there too much of the romance thing? Can we play that card too many times? Like how many romances do we need in a wrestling show? Should it be just one? Or are you cool with there's multiple romances? There's multiple romances in life. Yeah, but it starts to feel a little fucking soap opera-y, doesn't it? The fuck you think you're watching, Conrad? Well, one for dudes where we're beating ass and not dating. I'm not even going to comment on that. Well... <laughs> I'm just saying, like, I want to see guys fight. I don't necessarily want to see, I love my girlfriend. Like, what well, if that? you're fighting over your girlfriend. But everybody's fighting over a girl? That's well, a little silly. It's called life. Okay. Well, Correct man. me when I'm wrong. Uh, there's a No Way Out pay-per-view in February. Tori is going to help X-Pac beat Kane. Uh, but Kane goes on to get the final win of this feud, WrestleMania 2000, teaming with Rikishi. To defeat X Pac and Road Dog, probably time to move on. At King of the Ring 2000, we got X Pac, Road Dog, and Tori defeating the Dudley Boys in a dumpster match. During the bout, believe it or not, Tori is power bombed through a table by the Dudley Boys. That is the end of her affiliation with X Pac. Did she get along well with Sean Waltman behind the scenes? Why was yeah, the time for so. her to move on? I think Tori got along with everybody. She's a really, really nice lady. August of 2000, there's some dissension now between X-Pac and Road Dog, and they're going to face each other at SummerSlam. X-Pac's going to win the match after a low blow, and afterwards, Road Dog is going to attack X-Pac, making that the end of their tag team, and I guess the official uh, dissolution of DX. And it feels like every time they, they sort of end this faction, it goes out with a whimper and not a bang. And that's sort of a similar story of the NWO. Do you credit that to just the audience at the time? what we were leaning on this quote unquote crash TV format or we booking week to week. Why wasn't there a big blow off once and for all, do you think for DX or the NWO? Well, first of all, by the time it got there, it wasn't the same, the same, the DX that everybody knew and loved. Right. Different machination. And I'd say the same thing for the NWO as well. There, it wasn't, you know, to me, the NWO was the outsiders and Hulk everybody else was just too many additions and too much Gaga. I mean, everybody else. So, uh, had the NWO remain, you know, those guys maybe with Bischoff, then blow that up. But when you're blowing up, you know, less significant talent, you know, throughout the whole thing, it just keeps meaning less. And when, the group that you loved in DX and you've changed it so many times, it just means less. Every time you change it, it means less. Well, let's talk about what's next here. Uh, September of 2000, we see Xbox start feuding with Jericho. They have a match at unforgiven. And then, uh, again, at no mercy in October, this time in a cage somewhere along this feud with Chris Jericho is where Xbox suffers a neck injury during a power bomb from Chris Jericho. Waltman's going to wind up on the sidelines for three months. Do you remember if Sean was upset here? I know this is a trying time uh, for Jericho because 
he's not yet become the man and, and, and won the world title and the undisputed belt and all that jazz. And he wrote about it in a lot in his book that he was trying to sort of find his footing and figure out how to be a WWE wrestler. Do you think him hurting Waltman? I know it was, in, I know it was accidental, but do you think that created some quote unquote heat for a guy like Jericho who was fresh over from WCW? Probably so. Yeah. You know, wouldn't surprise me. And again, you know, the, the same ballet, man, and accidents do happen, but, uh, I would say that, yeah, it probably did create heat for him. It probably looked at him as sloppy and, you know, nah, not as good as everybody says he is type thing. But it's a physical business. It's physical business and people get hurt, unfortunately. Well, and unfortunately, when they get hurt, a lot of times they look to pain relievers, as a lot of people do after a major surgery or a major injury. And when X-Pac comes back in 2001, he's a part of a new faction. They're calling it X-Factor with Albert and Justin Incredible. Uh, it is a bit of an odd pairing. Maybe the most notable thing is their theme song was done by Uncle Cracker, who I guess was a decent recording artist at the time. But there starts to be whispers that maybe perhaps Sean was having some of those demons rear their head again. If this is the right timeline, do you attribute that to maybe... While he was out with the injury, maybe started to take a few too many. Wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. But you don't, you know, it, it, until going through this, I had totally forgotten about the whole thing with Albert and just incredible. incredible. Holy yeah. shit. What a rotten group. Well, despite the rain occurring during the WCW invasion angle where the WWF side is mostly portrayed as faces. Fans are really all over Sean Waltman. There, there was even a thing online where people started to call it X-Pac heat. And it's even acknowledged by Billy Kidman on TV and later on with edge. They're actually using the frame, the phrase X-Pac heat and equating it to be what people used to call quote unquote, go away heat. Yep. Now I know that that narrative existed online, but did it exist in real life? Do you think, or was this just. Hey, we're leaning into it because there's internet chatter. I think you felt it. I think that there was, they'd seen, you know, they were just tired of it. And and some of it was kind of crass, you know, is the things that he did just were crass. It wasn't cute and funny anymore. But he'd gotten older. And he'd gotten surlier. And I think that it was just, okay, enough already. I've, I'm tired. Next, go away. X-Pac really gets lost in the invasion. X-Factor is going to break up. Credible is going to join the Alliance. And even though Waltman would win the cruiserweight title from Kidman and hold that title and then feud with Tajiri, it feels like he's just stuck. Uh, X-Pac does return to TV after taking some time off for injuries to join the NWO. He attacks Hulk Hogan, tries to cut another promo like when he first rejoined the WWF, but for whatever reason, it just doesn't work. And it's once again portrayed that Waltman is the quote unquote little buddy of the group again. And he winds up being hurt during a match with Booker T and gold dust needs more time off. I'm sure at this point, whether it's fair or not, uh, people in the office probably start to wonder, is he reliable? Is he dependable? Is he injury prone? Are those things that people were saying at the time? Do you think? I think that, you know, it was more along the lines of, okay, is this just, does he need to go away and learn a new hold? Because the audience was tired of him. And in addition to that, I, I think that, you know, he may have just gone back to his demons and they grabbed a hold of him and, and it was just something he couldn't shake. So it was when you go back and you want to be, hey, man, I'm 23 again and I'm invincible. You're not, man. And you're in the shape you're in because of some of the things that you did earlier on from the some of the crazy bumps to whatever drug that you use to help recuperate from those things it's, it takes its toll and i think that this was the time period where it was really starting to take its toll on sean we should at least acknowledge that uh x -Pac is on that now infamous plane ride from hell in early may and allegedly according to the rumor and innuendo he cut Michael Hayes ponytail off. Is that the way you remember hearing that? Uh, I might've heard that. I wasn't on it. 
Do you remember it being a disciplinary thing or is this just boys will be boys? What was a disciplinary thing? Cutting Cut Michael's off. hair off? Yes. <laughs> I, I don't even understand the question. The, is it okay you, to you cut other disciplining people? him for something? No, no, no. I'm asking, did Waltman get in fucking trouble? Why are you being arguing? Oh, oh, I thought you were saying was the haircut. No, no, no. Thing. I know it's boys being boys. I'm wondering, is Waltman in trouble for cutting a guy's hair? Uh I, I don't mean, know. I mean, I really honest to God, I, I do not know. And uh I don't remember. You know, Let me I don't, say, like, you know, Waltman told me he did it. Right. So it wasn't like it was a secret. I don't think he ever denied doing it. He probably was looking for your approval. You got on his ass so bad about the haircut he gave Jeff Jarrett. He wanted to show you he could do it right. And 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 if that were the case, I would have told him it's bullshit. You should shave his fucking head. <laughs> no, yeah, I thought you were saying, uh, wait a minute, is Waltman dis disciplining Michael? Oh, no, no, no. Him, what the fuck? No, no, of course not. Just in my head. Well, he would deserve to be disciplined by God. Let's just say hypothetically, if you're on a plane to Saudi Arabia one day and you wake up and all your hair is gone, is it just another day at the office or is somebody's ass in trouble? Hypothetically. Well, it depends on, I, again, if somebody shaved my head, I would probably be pissed. <laughs> probably. Yeah. Yeah, probably. Okay. Yeah, well, listen, if they use that manscaped uh, beard hedger pro kit, you might be just fine. I like yeah. my look. Exactly. You get uh, so, it depends on it depends on what level. Yeah, <laughs> what guard did you use? Yeah, exactly. Uh, if it's in like a three, then you know shit, just a haircut. Summer no, cut. Be like be like Jeff Jarrett. Yeah, goddamn, I lost match. I get a I get a haircut. Yay. What would Dusty call that? A three guard? No, that was that, that was my thumb cut. There you go. Well, thumb cut pumpkin head. The hat don't fit the thing no more because they ain't got all the fluff. My thumb cut. Uh, the NWO would disband after Nash tears his quad and in something of unheard of move at the time, Jim Ross announces at SummerSlam that Waltman and WWE had parted ways. I mean, that's not something we saw all the time. It's announced no. on the freaking show. And I'm wondering, was this just a, a bad relationship at the end? Did Waltman have a bunch of heat? What was going on here? What, why, why did it end this way? I just, you know, I think it was just time. And I, frankly, I think that, you know, everybody was just kind of fed up with it and wanted to move on. I do want to mention that Sean is eventually going to be back in the good graces of the company. Of course, he's going to be in the hall of fame more than once. Uh, he's also going to be a part of FCW, uh, help himself to, uh, uh, some training down at NXT where he's going to be uh, a guest coach every now and again. Um, what do you think his legacy is going to be in pro wrestling when it's all said and done, Sean Waltman? You know, I, I think that um, I would say, as we used to call in the business, a journeyman, you know, a guy that, that went through and did really well wherever he did, whatever territory that he went to, but he worked a lot of different territories and did a lot of different things. I think Sean's, you know, a step above that. Um, tremendous performer. And someone that was able, had the skill set to get over, but also to get other people over. So that's a unique skill set and uh, one that he definitely had was good at. Great question here from Instagram, a wrestling historian. Was there ever talk of putting the Intercontinental Championship on Sean Waltman? Which is one of those things where, again, I would have said, well, yeah, he won that. Yeah, I was just dude. I was just gonna say he was an Intercontinental Champion. He, he he's a tag team champ with Bob Holly, Marty Jannetty, Bob European Holly, Kane twice, European champ twice, light heavyweight champ twice, WCW Cruiserweight champ once. Two separate Hall of Fames in nineteen as DX in twenty twenty as the NWO. Won a Slammy once in ninety four, but no Intercontinental title. And again, I would have thought. Wait a minute. What do you mean he wasn't in a WrestleMania until 99? What do you mean he didn't win the Intercontinental title? Was it ever seriously? That's confused? shocking. You know, you know what? It was probably discussed. Ah, I'm not going to give that to him again. Right. <laughs> I don't know. I, I thought he was, actually. It's crazy. Um, Francis Reyes, great listener of the show, always bringing the good questions, wants to know, when do you think 
was peak Waltman in his career. So I, everybody has different answers for like when Ric Flair's peak was. I think Sean, to me, his peak, my favorite stuff of Sean's was like the fall of 97 till WrestleMania 14. His heel stuff through that DX run was just unbelievable. My favorite era of Sean. You have a favorite era of Waltman. Yes. The 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 whole one two the the one two three kid era, wow! The you're becoming the one two three kid. I just enjoyed the hell out of that. It was just so much fun, and it was and it was nice. It was nice to see a young guy. It was fresh. It was it was fun to me. Dylan Leahy wants to know: Did Bruce ever think Sean could have been a world champion for the company? And I want to ask a second parter: Do you think he's one of those guys who just came along too soon? Would he be considered more likely to be considered to be a champ now than he was then just based on the way the perceptions have changed? I mean, possibly, but, but during his time, no, I wouldn't have. And that, that goes to a lot of factors. Um, his work. Yes. But probably, you know, the outside factors from the drug usage and attitude sometimes and the way he conducted himself outside of the ring uh, and the immaturity, I, I think, would have prevented that from happening. Uh, Jonathan says, do you think Sean Waltman gets enough credit for changing perceptions in WWE? He showed you could be a quote-unquote smaller guy and still have better high-quality matches and still work with anyone. I think he, I think it, he gets a lot of that credit. Because, man, he was one of the first to, to really help bridge that size barrier. Yes. And you can, you can go back and look at the accomplishments of what Sean Waltman did and go, go back and look at his contemporaries and go, oh, my God, you know, what's, what's different here? And so to me, I think that, that Sean Waltman, without a doubt, was a catalyst in breaking that size barrier for not just this company, but for every company. I want to ask, and this is a question that we're going to get a bunch of, if I don't at least ask it. And I know you might not know because you weren't always there on the road and in the locker rooms and all that, but Cajun Jack says, has any of the backstage staff been victims of poop in their bag? Or was that always reserved for the boys for better or worse, Bruce? A lot of people associate the doo-doo ribs with Sean Waltman. Um, I don't ever remember anybody from, uh, in the office per se, I, I will. So thank you for bringing that up. Not a doo doo rib, but, um, so we, we ran like, uh, high schools for TVs and things of that nature for a long time. And, and Jerry Jarrett one day was traveling with me and Vince and Pat and made the definitive statement. Well, I have never been ribbed. Pat and I looked at each other like, really? Never? Never. Never. I've never, no one has ever ribbed me. Wow, oh, that's amazing. Somehow, that quote got out. And um, I, mean, I might have mentioned somebody. Pat and I might have talked, you know, about it. And we were in a high school uh so like you're using the gym and everything and there was a, a coach's office that was Vince's office and in it was a desk that was bolted to the to the floor okay so this desk you could not budge it it's bolted to the floor couldn't move and uh we all left our stuff in there and I'll be damned if somehow Jerry Jarrett's briefcase, somehow, some way, and I, on my children's head, I had did not do it. But somehow his stuff got um, handcuffed, padlocked, and chained to his desk. And... Jerry came in was just like, oh, my God, How, why would anyone do this to me? I said, like, Jesus Christ, Jerry, that's amazing. You've never been ripped. What? How now? And 
the <laughs> he can speak freely. He's no longer with us. You can tell the story. Oh goddamn! No, no, I'm I'm telling the story. It's just it was just so goddamn funny. So the cops, he called the cops. Oh goodness! He called the police because his bag had been padlocked. The chain that was used, they went to go get a, a bolt cutter for the chain, but the chain was so thick that the couldn't bolt cutter it. couldn't even put a nick in it. Wow. The handcuffs, which Jerry said it is, well, it's illegal for anyone other than a police officer to have handcuffs. So he was going on that for the illegality of this whole prank. <laughs> in the middle of it, like everybody's coming in to look at it because he has made such a big deal out of it. Right. That now everybody's got to see, you know, because, you know, guys get their bags padlocked to to the door or in the locker room somehow, you know, you get, you get a padlock just put on your bag. So, you got to carry around. You got a bunch of padlocks on your bag. Um, it's a harmless prank. It's a ha ha. But he called the cops. Yeah. And so Sean Maltman walks in. He's like, oh my God, Jerry. That is fucked up. Whoever the fuck ripped you, man, we're going to find him. We're going to fuck him up. <laughs> and Luna Vashon comes in. And Luna looks and goes, ah, my God, those are my fucking handcuffs. Whoever fucking, somebody had, hey, somebody had to go into my bag and get those fucking handcuffs. Those are my handcuffs. I, I was going to call the cops to come in and, and do an investigation about people stealing my shit in my bag. And finally, the cops are watching this shit. Mm. <laughs> and I mean, they see right through it. Like they're like, okay. And maybe Pat and I, and maybe a kid, um, maybe Luna kind of got off to the side <laughs> and said, all right, bolt cutters aren't working. Um, the padlocks have this, um, uh, some kind of gimmick in it so that like, even if you were to, cut them they still had like this fucking uncuttable wire <laughs> you know it was a great job man let me tell you and um the only way that really could have released everything is the handcuffs now handcuffs are a universal key right okay but these handcuffs were special handcuffs i guess and so um Luna was able to go and get the find the handcuff key, and we had to let it go. But it was the cops were like, "Come on, guys, just unlock the shit. <laughs> you know, I'll let it go." So we finally unlocked the shit and and let it go. But Waltman was fucking priceless, absolutely priceless, and so innocent. Like, God damn, the bastards that did this were gonna get them. Yeah. And then, like, you know, Jerry's bag shit just kept happening to it. My goodness. Huh? Well, I, I never. My, oh, anyway. Duty ribs. You got any uh, Sean Waltman duty ribs you can tell us I about? don't. I don't. I, I never got duty in my bag. And... Well, allegedly, there was duty in Jerry Lawler's crown and Mark Henry's food. I don't even think, I don't even think that. Uh... Was Waltman even there when Jerry? I'm not sure. I just know that the doo doo stories tend to follow him around. I don't even. Yeah, know I don't think he was. No, there's, there, there's no. I mean, they they may, and he may have. I'm sure, he has. Who knows? I've never watched him doo doo in anything. <laughs> um, and the you know the doo doo meister is somebody that that you know is no longer there, so doesn't master. The doo doo well, monster. If 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 some reason, if for some reason he winds up hypothetically at another Hall of Fame or a guest appearance on a Raw or a SmackDown, and someone happens to get doo doo in their bag, do you think everybody is just going to assume? 
I mean, he could be framed here. We got to exonerate him of all these duty stories. Just because he's there doesn't mean he did it. That's true. And he had to learn from someone. Who taught him the way of the doo-doo? I don't know. The way of the doo-doo. It's, 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 there's a few different, there's a few different uh, doo-doo meisters in the biz. Does one of them wrestle, used to wrestle with three initials? Because I've, I've heard a story about a big Texan who maybe could drop things off every now and again. No. No. Who were who was the second shooter, Bruce? You know of another doo-dooer. You're not. Oh, I know. Of, I know of a couple of other doo-dooers. Come on, what's the hold up? Spill the spill the doo-doo. No, I can't. I can't. I can't. I can't. Oh wait, is this going to become the new buried alive? Yeah. You won't, you won't tell us the secret now. You won't no, tell I us. Won't tell doo-doo. Secret doo-doo. Okay, I'll tell you one of them since they're, they're no longer with us. Was Kurt Hennig? Oh yeah, he was. And, king and Kurt, yeah, Kurt. Kurt enjoyed enjoyed a good doo doo. It is he the one who would maybe crack the back window in a car, or if one of the guys had, he would slide it in. Have you heard that version? I have no idea. I know that he used to like uh, paper, and some one time they had a nice log, and it wrapped it up in paper, and it froze. So it went from bag to bag, frozen. I heard that what he did once. Look, man, when you're on the road and there's there's shit to do, by God, and there's just there's time on your hands, your mind can wander. That's the beautiful thing about uh, not having all that time anymore. It's a different world, kids. There you go. Excellent way to end our episode on one, two, three, kid. It's a different world, kid. It's a different world, kids. Or keep up with Sean Waltman if you haven't already. And, and I, I think I told this story one time uh, real quick uh, on, on the kid thing. Let's talk about the kid. We were doing the uh, WrestleMania 11. We had Jonathan Taylor Thomas, who was at the time, I think the Lion King had just come out and he was the voice of the lion in there, the little baby lion. And he was also the star of Home Improvement, you know, uh, Tim the Toolman Taylor's son and all this shit. Big star. He was a kid, like nine years old, something like that. And we were doing a scene with him and Sean for WrestleMania. And I'm going over and I'm producing. And I'm talking about and the kid and the kid and the kid does this and the kid and the kid and the kid. And the mother of Jonathan Taylor Thomas pulls me off to the side. He says, excuse me, but I would really appreciate it if you would stop with the kid stuff. My son has a name. And I prefer you call him Jonathan instead of just the kid. I was like, um, okay. But um, the kid has a name too. And he's the kid. Talking about Sean Waltman. And she's like, what? I said, that's his name. One, two, three, kid. We just call him kid, the kid. And she like got real small, shrunk up into a ball and never mind. <laughs> that was a good one. Yeah. The kid has a name. It's Jonathan. He can call him his name. I said, yeah, well, that kid's got a name too. It's the kid. Or. Oh, goodness gracious. Follow Sean on Twitter if you haven't already at the real Xbox. That's at the real Xbox. Uh, my man is uh, doing big things and he's working on some even cooler things. So be sure to follow him on Twitter. You never know where he's going to pop up next or what he's got up his sleeve. Uh, but he's created a bunch of content over the years. I think he's still got his podcast linked in his bio. Uh, we're big fans of Sean Waltman. Hope you are too. And hope that we paid homage to one of the greatest wrestlers WWE ever had. And don't just take our word for it. He's in the WWE Hall of Fame not once, but twice uh, with both DX and with the NWO. Very few guys can say that, man. When the business was hotter than ever during the Monday Night Wars, the two hottest factions, the NWO and DX, he's right in the middle of both of them. Sean Altman, man, ahead of his time, one of a kind. and Hell of a career. Still just 51 years old, man. God, so, man. What, he's a kid. He is. And uh, we'll be back next week talking about uh, SummerSlam 2008. I can't believe this I is real. Ask me something. Oh, yeah. We do have ask me questions and shit. 
Uh, we've also got uh, SummerSlam 93, Dudley Boys on Deck, Unforgiven 03. Lots of fun stuff. Get all these shows early and ad free over at adfreeshows.com. Uh, be sure to support our YouTube channel if you haven't already. Check it out. It's something to wrestle.com. Got some great new swag and merch available too over at uh, something to wrestle shirts.com. You can interact with the uh, show, ask questions about some of our topics at Pritchard Show on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Uh, and I also want to mention in my real life, man, I'm helping people save money. And that was an excellent time to do that. Uh, you get to skip your next two house payments and you get rid of all your credit card debt, just like that. You don't need perfect credit. You don't need money out of your pocket, but we're routinely helping our podcast listeners save a boatload of cash. A couple of weeks ago, I helped a family save $681 a month. How much can you save? Find out right now for free at savewithconrad.com and check out our reviews, man. We've got an A plus rating with the BBB over a thousand five-star reviews at conradreviews.com. And we would love to help you save some cash. And if you've been on the fence about buying a house, and I've heard this a lot lately, well, I'm going to wait and buy when the rates go down. Well, so is everyone else. And that is what happened a few years ago where you started to hear people overpaying for houses. They'd have to bid 50 or even $100,000 over asking price in order to get that house. You don't want to do that. Now you can actually get a good deal. Uh, lots of folks are cutting deals to get out of that deal and move on. So my advice to you would be, Date the rate, marry the house. You're going to keep that house for a long, long time. The interest rates are going to come down. They always go up and down. So why not lock in the house you love right now? And okay, your payment will be higher for a little bit. What, a year, 18 months, whatever it may be. But think about how much more your house is going to be worth when those rates rebound. And if you're trying to buy then, you're going to get stuck overpaying. My point is, don't get stuck overpaying 50 grand in a couple of years when rates are much, much better. And maybe what is the payment difference now? $300 a month, not to diminish that. I know it adds up, but that's $7,000 in a few years versus $50,000 higher. Don't do that. Find out how much money you can save right now at savewithconrad.com. You don't need perfect credit. You don't need money out of your pocket, but if you feel stuck making minimum payments on your credit cards, if you'd like to save some cash and skip a couple of house payments, or maybe you're tired of throwing your money away on rent. I want to get you in a house at savewithconrad.com. And one last word about buying a house. When have you ever heard a landlord approach a tenant and say, you know what? I really appreciate you. Next year, I think I'm going to lower your rent. That's never happened. Rent always goes up. Lock in a deal for your family with my family at savewithconrad.com. Bruce, appreciate all the time today. This was a blast. I love talking about Sean Waltman. Uh, I hope we did him justice. And I'm looking forward to uh, doing it again sooner rather than later with you, bud. All right, rock on. We'll see you next week right here on Something to Wrestle with Bruce Pritchard. Now rock on, right? Now rock on, yeah. Rock on. Hey, guys, Eric Bischoff here. and just want to call a quick timeout. I want to tell your listeners about what I've been telling everybody at over at 83 Weeks quite a while now about all the cool things that are happening over at adfreeshows.com. On the debut episode of Making the Town, Blue Meanie takes us through the memorable matches and moments of the famed ECW arena, including one that was never seen. Something very special happened after the power went off. Uh, Paul Heyman went out into the ring and spoke to the crowd without a microphone, and the crowd just stayed quiet and listened, and he gave the most heartfelt thank you to that crowd that night. And uh, the biggest shame of it is there's no footage of it because the power went out. On an all-new Tuesday with the Taskmaster, Kevin Sullivan talks about what some of the greatest factions of all time have in common. Four horsemen, four guys, mm. when they're the strongest. NWO, four guys when they're the strongest. And then Bloodline, four guys. But they also had a manager, each one of them. JJ, Eric, and Paul E. That's just a small taste of what we've got waiting for you with four levels to choose from. See for yourself why Ad Free Shows is the best value in wrestling today. Sign up now at adfreeshows.com.